Can I introduce Craig Mandel? If you don't know Craig, he's the director of Aspire to Lead, working in education, uh, coaching and training, but also across uh, the business world as well, as an ex-teacher, mentoring and change management. He's looking at the optimum flow, or the links between the optimum flow of knowledge and collaborative learning. So Paul should just fit very nicely with what you were, you were saying. I've asked uh, Craig to make some opening comments about uh, collaboration in, the, in this context. Please welcome Craig. Kia ora tātou katoa, e mihi ki maha. Thank you, Lyle. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to share in some thoughts. We've taken a slightly different approach, Kim and myself, um, that I'll provide a little bit of, in fact, I'll, I'll take a step back um, and, like others have done, congratulate the students and what they shared right at the start of the day. One of the th most powerful uh, things that was said was when Paige talked about the why. And we've got to get that right in terms of mindsets and in terms of what it looks like and what it's based on, what's the rationale. So that was really cool that you, that you said that because I think too often we think about the what, we know what we do in education, okay, we know what it might look like, uh, but if you're actually facilitating or managing or leading change, then you've got to get the why sorted and you've got to get the why embedded in everyone's heads before you can actually move forward. So I'm going to provide what I hope will be uh, a slightly different angle and a piece of research and linking it to culture and collaboration. So it's a little bit of stand up and deliver, but we might pause and reflect it. And then Kim's going to share a practical example of of what it looks like or what, it's, what it feels like and, and what has actually happened in terms of collaboration and her good, really good research and work around clusters. So that's our approach. As Lyle has said, there'll be an opportunity for, for you to ping some questions at us, uh, but then we're moving into the, table, the tables after, after us to really unpack what we've said and perhaps what Paul has said and then tabling those questions. Mature moment, forgot about the glasses. Does everyone lose them on top of the head like me do? I do? That's good. So, so what I'm going to do is, is just draw on what I think is a significant piece of research. And it was interesting, to, I mean, it's wonderful to hear Steve cross those boundaries between business and education. And so I'm going to share a few thoughts around, around a significant piece of research by, and Paul's mentioned his name already, Andy Hargraves, who's also helped by Alma Harris. Many in the education field would know those two really well. So I'm, I'm going to go back to that, but first there's a couple of pieces that actually came across my desk, and sometimes it's just like a little bit, wow, that's perfect timing. And one, one piece, and it's quite significant, produced by the Ministry in May 2014, and I don't know whether people have actually deciphered it, but it's a very, very in-depth document called Future Focused Learning and Connected Communities. And the focus is on e-learning, but they talk about the evidence that collaborating in regional networks in partnership with our communities produce better outcomes for students. Well, we've heard that before, haven't we? And we must achieve better outcomes for all learners in our communities through investing in people and innovation, building regional capability through collaboration, and implementing a coordinated system-wide effort to align core elements of learning. They sound like pretty foundational stuff that what we're talking about, if we're talking about the IES, and we need to be assured that it's around the people, innovation, it's around investment, it's around collaboration, and it's around having good systems to support that. It seems logical, and that was really good learning from that document. The second was published by the School Trustees Association in June this year, and they titled it, and many of you might have read this as well, Building and Sustaining Improvement in the Long Term. And in, in, in a way, that's sort of what this is about, isn't it? It's around building and sustaining improvement for the students in the long term. So, so and I'm not quite sure who wrote this in, in the School Trustees Association news, but it, they drew on the words of Michael Fullan. And it's really, from my perspective, it's really good that he's still involved in the project, uh, I think as some sort of um, advisory role, which is really good. But he talks about the power of collective cas capability and that it enables ordinary people to do extraordinary things for two reasons. One, knowledge about effective practices that comes widely available and accessible on a daily basis. I like that phrase you use, Paul, because that talk that's around getting that knowledge mobilised, isn't it? And the second, and more powerfully, is working together to generate commitment and morally accepting, and this is what Fulham talks about, 
morally accepting that the purpose of collaboration is for students and staff to work together to make life and society better. Surely that's going to be, going to be one of the key, key aspects of success of this project is that the collaboration has purpose and there's a real focus to it. The big piece of research that I referred to right at the start is called Performance Beyond Expectations. It comes out of the National College of School Leadership and the principal investigators are Andy Hargraves and Elmer Harris with, along with a, a bigger, wider team. Their study had addressed three key research questions. What characteristics make organisations of different types successful and sustainable, far beyond expectations? How does sustainability of performance beyond expectations in leadership and change manifest itself in education compared with other sectors? And what are the implications for schools and schools leader? So there's real synergy in this study between, in this case, business, sport and schools. Correct me if I'm right, I don't know of another study in the world that has actually gone right across businesses, sports organisations and schools. And that's why I think it's quite a powerful piece of research that we, we need to consider. 18 organisations, multiple sectors, five countries, three continents. It's a global study. And what they did, and it was really quite clever, and, and uh, um, I can't... I'll, um, There'll be slides available, I guess I guess is what I'm saying afterwards, won't they, Lyle? I'll have this in a slide so that you can remember them. But they talk about data-driven heuristic framework, and it's called, affectionately, called the F-15. If it's called after the fighter, then I guess we're talking a high-performance sort of um, plane, aren't we? They call it the F-15. And so when you, when you hear these, and they all are F-words, nice F-words, Okay, or the phrases that have got the F in. So, so, so when I heard Andy Hargraves talk about this back in 2010 in Sydney in the ACL conference, you know, that was deliberate to be a little bit sort of quirky, a little bit different. But here are the 15, and I guess what I encourage you to do is to think about one of those Fs, those good Fs, and think, to, well, we've got the IES, all right? We've, we're thinking about culture, we're thinking about collaboration, how can that apply in my setting and my context? So here's F1, the fantastic dream. You need that vision, you need that purpose, you need that clarity around what the why. F2 is the fear, and I translate that to a sense of urgency. What's the alternative? If we don't do something different, if we don't do something significant, okay, are things going to change? And so the fear is they won't change unless we actually think and behave differently within this type of model. F3 is the fight, and that's around removing obstacles and being, being brave enough to actually say, um, no, this is actually what we need to do. Fundamental futures is F4, and that's around building on legacies. Firm foundations is around relationships and new infrastructures. And there's probably a key question that I pose to you to think about if you think about the IES and you think about your school setting or your business setting, Answer the question and ponder it just for a minute. What is so precious and central with your organisation that you need to keep it in order to succeed? There's a powerful question to think about and reflect. Equally powerful in terms of change is a second question. What that has been valued before do I need to give up or do we need to give up in order to create space for change and innovation? F6 is fortitude, and that's around resilience. F7 is counterflow, prepared to challenge existing practices that are not working. F8 is fast and fear tracking, identifying targets and indicators that are transparent and that are easy to monitor. F9, feasible growth, and I guess we're learning, certainly around crisis around the learning clusters, and Kim might have, have something to add to this, that you need to set up systems and even schedules that are sustainable uh, and that you're not going to burn out resources. I guess if you personally be interested to see where the community of schools go in terms of the clusters with, under the IES and, and how they merge or how they differentiate themselves with the current learning clusters. You know, burnout and using those resources of a talented pool of people uh, are high, high factors that will not ensure sustainability. 
One of the significant sections of that paper is actually titled Culture and Collaboration, which is very cool, and thus why it attracted my attention. So F10 is around high fidelity, a deep commitment to what best works for students. So these five are particularly important for marrying that culture and collaboration. F11 is fraternity, the building and sustaining a sense of community. F12 is flair, flow and flexibility, means identifying and having a nat uh, naturally talented team who are prepared to take risks and who are creatively valued. You know, we, I guess what I'm thinking is we don't need to an environment where it's all compliance driven and all target driven. We need to have that created creativity amongst those leaders, both within the schools um, and, of course, um, within the clusters. F13 is failability and acceptance that mistakes are made and acknowledged. F14, and this is an interesting one, especially given the history of enrolment zones around Christchurch, is friendly rivalry, combining competition with collaboration, recognising that the success partly rests on the success of others and that there needs to be a strong sense of social justice in providing service to less fortunate schools, a really important part of collaboration. And as you can imagine, and we talked about some of those things around culture, um, those values and beliefs are really important. And F15, fusion leadership. Investing in leadership and fellowship that raises and rallies the performance of schools by lifting communities spiritually, emotionally, spiritually and morally through a combination and progression of leadership styles and strategies. So in a way, is that a new type of leadership, fusion leadership? Something to ponder. In summary, from me anyway, leaders who perform beyond expectations, and this is what the research says, have a proper sense of urgency, but they do not deplete their own and others' resources and energy by expanding and changing too fast or in too many directions. Leaders who perform beyond expectations make intelligent and informed use of evidence and statistics, but they're never dazzled or driven solely by the data. That fusion leadership talks about moral emotional and spiritual leadership. Leaders who perform beyond expectations know how to run against the grain and bowl uphill into the wind. I guess from a personal perspective, ultimately, the challenge and the opportunity is that all within the wider educational community need to systematically change mindsets and mental models around culture and collaboration. In, in turn, that is fundamental to the innovative change structures and processes, what I perceive, as being available or a, an opportunity to invest in the Education Success Initiative. I'll leave you with a quote that perhaps sums up, uh, I guess, not only the research, but I guess my own personal view, is draw on Albert Einstein. We can't solve a problem with the thinking that created it. Thus, we need to think differently. Thanks, and I'll let Kim uh, do, do the hard yard. Thank you, Craig. We look forward to getting your um, PowerPoint for downstream reference. That was a, a wonderful commentary. Can I now introduce um, Kim Alexander, the principal of Redcliffe School? And uh, last year you had that research fellowship and you've done some work both locally and overseas in collaboration, I think, Kim? Yep. And, and you're, she's particularly interested in how learning communities can make a long-term difference which is what we talked about this morning in terms of the progress of the students. So please welcome Kim. Okay, thank you, Lyle, and uh, thanks, Craig, for your commentary. Um, so when Craig and I decided how we were going to put our commentary together, uh, we discovered that... Um, they kind of marry up quite well because uh, Craig was um, much more well researched than than I am, uh, and um, we thought what we'd do is because it's a discussion straight after ours, we'd we'd talk a little bit about um, our thoughts, and then there will be a little wee bit of time left at the end, perhaps to respond to what we have raised before we go into um, the roundtable discussions. And thank you, Paul, for coming this afternoon and filling in for uh, Dr Stoop. Um, 
I just want to start by saying that this room is full of experts and uh, lots of people with a huge amount of knowledge. And I'm just here sharing my thoughts and experiences. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on cluster collaboration. This is simply um, things that have, I've learnt about and experienced over the last few years. Uh, I am a great supporter of collaboration and um, many of you will know that Redcliffe School has had quite an adventurous time since February 2011. Uh, I, th I feel like I've had two principal's jobs at Redcliffe, everything that happened pre-2011 and everything that's happened since then and they've just been like two completely different jobs in many respects. Um, but one thing that's been really constant for me is that I've belonged to, uh, my school has belonged to the Bayes Cluster, um, which we formed about the start of 2008. And so that cluster support and loyalty has made a big difference for my school since 2011. So um, collaboration takes on many forms and sometimes it's uh, just about having a really supportive network of people. Uh, we, we did even spend some time camped out at Sumner School and uh, I've had a lot of support from the other schools in my cluster. So uh, it's been an interesting time. Um, so last year I received the uh, CPPA Fellowship which uh, enabled me to go and do a wee bit of research, um, which was very nice, and have a wee bit of time away. And I undertook my research on uh, cluster collaboration. One reason was because I was already in an existing cluster um, and had been in other clusters for other things as well over years, and also because it was a time that the Christchurch Renewal Plan had placed uh, primary and secondary schools into learning community clusters. So it was very topical. And it remains very topical for an, a number of reasons. Uh, so I, that enabled me to undertake some research and um, go overseas and visit some um, other countries where uh, learning communities, clusters, uh, were already in operation and um, to see what was going on, and plus uh, reflect more on my own experience as well. Um, so that in itself is a whole presentation, which we don't have time for and I'm not going to go over, but I've, I have drawn out some of the conclusions that I came to from my research. And um, some of, well, hopefully all of them relate in some way to the environment we find ourselves working in at the moment in Christchurch with the clusters, uh, the learning community clusters, and also um, with the arrival of IES. So some of my thoughts are very simple. None of this is um, anything you won't have thought of before. First thing is that uh, I, I really believe that whatever we're put into clusters or we choose to be in collaborative clusters for, we have to, everyone needs to be open and transparent with the intent. And maybe we've had experience here in Christchurch where perhaps that wasn't. So I, I really feel that that has got to be the foundation, open and transparent with the intent, so that we have a shared understanding of the purpose. Um, one thing I found in my own cluster and uh, some of the clusters I have um, visited is that it, um, to me it seems really important that the leadership or the principals um, in those schools uh, have equal value. So that we might respect a particular strength that one of us has. Uh, we might use our differing expertise at different times. So if I think about my own cluster, um, we do 
the, the principles in my cluster, we certainly do have different strength areas and we'll draw on those strength areas depending on what we're doing at the time. But each of us is of equal standing and we collaborate very much on that platform. We certainly respect one another and of course there are times when we will use one another's differing expertise. Um, I think it's really important, and I'm sure many of you in primary and secondary schools will have discovered this um, over the last wee while, that we just, sometimes we just have to let collaborative communities evolve. And they do evolve over time. Um, trust will grow, and when the trust grows, the collaboration deepens. Uh, so in, in my own cluster, um, we've had changes of principles, we've had lots of things happen to us, a, as do all clusters. Uh, we, we've had to get to know one another and discover, discover one another's strengths and passions. Um, but the trust has grown over a long period of time, seven years now. And so as the trust has grown, the, the depth of the collaboration has grown. So allow, allow, the, allow the level of uh, collaboration to evolve. Don't just expect it's all there right from day one. The potential of learning communities or clusters is vast. There's just so, there's a huge potential. And, and we all know that because we see it in our own schools with professional learning groups, student leadership groups, everything else. The potential is vast. Um, it's particularly vast for professional learning. Uh, if we take staff, for example, over and over again in the clusters that I saw um, internationally, uh, I would say one of the um, commonalities all the time in successful clusters was the collaboration around professional learning. That might just be the buy-in power of being able to afford to um, purchase in a, prof a professional speaker for a teacher-only day, whatever it might be. Um, but that, that shared resource and uh, potential for um, growth and professional development is, is really huge. One of the clusters I saw in, um, in the UK, uh, in Norfolk, was a cluster of schools that's been operating together for quite some time. Um, and they, they're quite, I guess in some ways it's easier for them because they're in a town where there is one high school and uh, around about 10 primary schools when they go out sort of into the surrounding rural areas as well. And um, they now do some amazing things with their um, staff with professional learning. They have um, teacher inquiry groups across their schools, which I know there are actually some clusters in Christchurch doing that now. Um, and they're multi-level, uh, right from right from the start of primary school where they have their preschools attached right through high school, they have multi-level um, teacher professional inquiry groups. And um, that it's just, you talked before about that seamless, Lyle, you referred to that seamless transition uh, right through compulsory schooling. Um, they're, they're really demonstrating that. Helped, of course, by the fact there's one high school that they all feed into. So, yep, that did help. Uh, but it was really exciting to see the seamless pathways they were creating for children. So if, what, if someone's uh, professional inquiry group was around improving literacy, well, that's going to have spin-offs for everyone they teach, cross departments, everywhere else. So just some interesting things I saw and I thought, well, the exciting, exciting potential. Um, which we can adapt for our own settings. Uh, one of the things we found has worked really for our cluster is keep it simple and sustainable. So still KISS, but it's keep it simple and sustainable. Uh, our first things we did when we collaborated as a cluster, really we got together to organise a winter sports tournament. That's how we started collaborating. And that's just evolved and evolved. We employ our own uh, sports coordinator across our schools. We um, now have numerous events. We have, you know, from our own speech competition to our own cultural festival. 
um, and so forth. Then it evolved to let's provide professional development for our teachers as a cluster, um, let's share best practice, let's attempt to moderate our national standards, um, all sorts of things. So it really started so small that it was not too difficult, it was not too big. We didn't worry about what other clusters were doing. In fact, we didn't know any other clusters, so that was probably a good thing. So keep it simple and sustainable. Um, it doesn't matter what, what you do to start. You're building the trust and evolving the collaboration. Um, competition has been mentioned a few times uh, in terms of zoning and, um, let's face it, our funding is bums on seats. Uh, yes, there is competition. And one of the questions I asked the other schools um, I went and visited in, in other parts of the world was around that thing. What about the competition that you face? Do you have competition? Um, and yes, most of them did. We are competing. We, we are um, in a competitive environment in a number of ways. Just in my cluster alone, way out in the east, um, yep, it, it is competitive uh, in, in many ways. Sumner School did beat us at Cantermath yesterday, which was quite distressing. It's competitive on every level. Um, but you've just got to acknowledge it and move past it. Being competitive and competing for students, if it's, if it's fair and if it's open and discussed, it doesn't have to be... It doesn't have to prevent all the other ways you can collaborate. My school, we've lost a lot of students since uh, the earthquakes. We've lost a lot of students, obviously, because the population in Redcliffe has declined. We lost more because parents did not want their children travelling around more cliffs and more containers to get to um, our lovely site at Van Ash. Um, we've lost students for a variety of reasons. The whole population of my school lives closer to either Mount Pleasant School or Sumner School. Okay, so we operate completely out of our enrolment zone. So, and lots of challenges, lots of challenges. The competition is there. Acknowledge it, move on. In fact, your, all of your schools will be richer because you collaborate and you raise student achievement through that. And the big question, please always ask yourselves, and we don't always remember to do this, but we do try to, uh, the bottom line is, is the focus on student outcomes? Is the focus clearly on student outcomes? And it really does need to be, and you need to ask that question. Right, just very quickly, my thoughts on the implications of IES. And I'm sure all of these issues are being discussed and addressed by all those experts involved in the work streams of IES. Uh, so nothing new about this, but my ponderings. It's a lot of money. Does it encourage collaboration or does it encourage cooperation? We, we really need to think about that. Will it get to the right schools for the right students who need the investment? Not, and I'm not talking about just the weakest schools. I was going to use those terms that they, they're given now, those principles, but um, Paul told us new ones. They're so long I've forgotten what they were now, Paul. Um, but I might need to. I will actually. I'll just make it up as I go along. Um, so not just the weakest schools uh, and not just the very strongest schools who might be the first ones to apply for the IES funding but all those other schools. So is all that money going to get to the right schools for the right students who need that investment? There's the um, tension here of the equality versus the hierarchy with the IES positions. I believe, personally, that collaboration involves people collaborating on an equal setting, on an equal rank. The IES to me sounds like there's a little wee bit of a hierarchy there. I'm happy to be proven wrong, but that's just my thoughts. Um, the Innovation Fund, and I think there was inquiry time as well in there, isn't there, Paul? Um, they sound wonderful, uh, but my, my, belief, my assumption is you ha your school needs to be in an IES community to apply for that. 
No? Not the invasion fund, no. Okay, fabulous. So any school can. Great. We don't want them just to be carrots, do we? That sounds, I'm very excited now, I have to go away and read on that. Um, does it, will IES redefine leadership? So IES is going to give us some um, different pathways for leadership. Is it going to redefine what we see as leadership? Maybe it will. And the um, PPTA and NZDI, which was mentioned a number of times. Okay, so we do have maybe a wee bit happening here. The high school versus primary school leadership. Why is it that one group has already reached agreement and one group is far from it? So what is that? What is that tension there? I'm thinking it might be a... Um, what's your thing, Steve? The UGR? I'm thinking maybe there's a UGR or two woven into that high school, primary school, PPTA, NZDI dilemma. Um, that's it. That's all I have to say.